It's also some silicon factory. I started with a basic app. It has a scaffold widget, an app bar widget, and a couple text widgets that display info about my yellow Labrador rock. Widgets are the basic building blocks of a Flutter app. Each one is an immutable declaration and part of the user interface. And they can do a lot of things. There are structural elements like a button or menu, stylistic elements that propagate a font and color scheme, layout related widgets like padding, and much more. You can also compose new widgets out of existing ones too, so the combinations are endless. Let me hop into an editor and I'll show you what I mean. Say I wanted a background color on my dog's name. I can do that by wrapping the text widget with a decorated box. And now my text widget has a background color. Maybe I'd like a little padding between the edge of the color and my text though. I can do that by adding a padding widget in between them. I'll give it eight logical pixels of padding all the way around. And now I've got a little bit of padding. This process of putting widgets together is what we call composition. I'm composing my interface by combining a bunch of simple widgets, each of which handle one particular job. Padding past things, decorated box, decorates the box, and so on. Now, let's say I go to the animal shelter and I need a couple more yellow labs that I cannot live without. I can add a column widget inside the center widget and then make some more of these names. called size box to put a little blank space in between them. That gets me something like this. But you know, I've got a lot of repeated code here in these three named boxes. If I can make my own widget that just took a string and handled the details for me, well, I can. I'll make a stateless widget and call it dog name. A stateless widget is a widget that's composed of children, which is why it has a build method. It does not have any mutable state that it needs to track. When I say mutable state, I mean any properties that will change over time, like a text box would have a string that the user updates, for example, or a widget that's animated might have values that change. This one doesn't have any of that. It just needs a string for a name, which won't change, so stateless widget is a perfect fit. I can even make this string final. I can take that string in via the constructor, and because all the properties are final, I can mark this a const constructor. Now, I just need to fill in the build method with the same widgets I was using above. Only this time, the text widget will display the string from the widget's name property. Now, I can use this widget to simplify the code I have to start with. As you can see, I still get the same interface here, but my code's gotten a lot tighter thanks to stateless widget and Flutter's use of composition. So that's a little example of how composing with stateless widgets works. At this point, you might be asking yourself, you know, I see how these build methods work, but when do they get called? Well, let's start with just a single dog named widget. We tend to think of apps built with Flutter as a tree of widgets, and that's not a bad thing. But as mentioned at the beginning of this video, Widgets are really just configurations for pieces of an app's UI. They're blueprints. So what are the configurations for? Elements. An element is a widget that's been made real and mounted on screen. And it's the element tree that represents what's actually displaying on your device at any given moment. Each widget class has both a corresponding element class and a method to create an instance. Stateless widget, for example, creates a stateless element. That create element method gets called when the widget is mounted to the tree. Flutter asks the widget for an element, and then pops that element onto the element tree with a reference to the widget that created it. Stateful element then says, hey, I wonder if I should have any children, and calls the widget's build method. In the case of my app, it gets quite a few. These widgets then create their own elements, and they're mounted on the element tree as well. So my app now has two trees, one that represents what's actually on the screen, the elements, 
and one that holds the blueprints they were made from, the widgets. Now, you might be wondering, what starts the process of building and creating elements? What kicks off the whole thing, so to speak? Let me show you something you may not have noticed back in the beginning. The dog app class, which represents my entire app, is itself a stateless widget. I told you widgets can do almost everything, right? If you take a look at main, which is the entry point for the app, you can see it's calling this run app method, and that's the starting point. Run app takes a widget and mounts it as the root element for the app with the height and width constraints that match the size of the screen. Flutter progresses through multiple methods, <coughs> creating widgets, using them to make elements, and so on, until everything is built, mounted on screen, and ready to be laid out and rendered. Which is how I got my three little boxes with the names of yellow blacks. So that's an intro to composing with stateless widgets and building an interface. One thing we didn't talk about today is how to update or rebuild an interface when data changes. That's because stateless widgets don't really do that. They're stateless, so they can't track data over time or trigger rebuilds on their own. Fortunately, Flutter also has stateful widgets, which we'll tell you all about in the next episode of this series. In the meantime, for more information about Flutter and all of the many widgets, different from stateless widgets, how state objects work, and more. This is actually the second in a run of videos we're doing, so if you haven't seen the first one, I recommend scrolling down to the video description below where we have a link to it. If you have seen that first video, you're probably pretty familiar with stateless widgets. They're an immutable configuration, or blueprint, so to speak. Immutable word
They have a long lifespan. They can remain attached to the element tree even when the original widget gets replaced by a new one, as long as that new one is of the same type. For example, if the item counter widget itself were rebuilt, maybe from a, a change above it in the tree, the original item counter widget goes away, but since the new one is the same type of widget, the stateful element and state object stay right where they are. They survive the change in widgets and just mark themselves dirty so their children get rebuilt. Then the state object field method kicks out a new text widget using its count value with the new item counter widget's name value. The old text widget goes away, the new one's mounted, and the stateless element of the text stays right where it is. So that's how state can be maintained even after the widget that made the state object. It's kind of like stateful hot room though, right? You can push new code to your device without changing where you are in the app and what's going on. Here we're building new widgets with new properties, but that state stays the same. I'm not using it in this example, but there's even a method in the state class called did update widget that you can override if your state object needs to know when its widget gets replaced. Animated container, for example, uses this to know when it should start animating the change from one config to another. So, as you can see, state widgets give you the power to track data over time and update your apps UI to match, which is really handy. The ironic thing is, though, as you get better and better with Flutter, you'll probably find yourself writing fewer and fewer stateful widgets. One of the reasons is that a lot of the common use cases have already been implemented. For example, say you have a stream of data, and you want a stateful widget that rebuilds whenever the stream emits a new value. Well, that's a stream builder, and it's part of the Flutter framework. Another reason is that if you've got a bunch of nested stateful widgets, passing data through all those build methods and constructors can get cumbersome. Fortunately, there's another type of widget that makes it easy to access data stored near the top of the tree, even if you're 100 widgets down. It's called Inherited Widget, and we'll tell you all about it in the next video in this series. In the meantime, for more information about Flutter and all its many widgets, head to flutter.io. Okay, so basically, the yeah, stateful and stateless widgets work to build up. And stateful widgets have a state that has a longer life cycle than the widget itself. State, stateless widgets are immutable short-lived widgets. They keep on thinking really fast. Like they keep on getting destroyed and rebuilt really fast. Stateful widgets on the other hand, their state stays the same, the element stays the same. Like it does not get rebuilt again and again. But it's children. Child women are stateless widgets. They get rebuilt at every change of state. So, so the way we should configure our apps is Jitna bhi layouts wagara dalna stateless widgets. But layout banane ke liye jo data required wo is stateful widgets. Stateful files se stateless widgets dalna. Stateful widget ka like responsibility should be only to hold the state and manage the change in state. And how do we manage the change in state? By like calling the set state. State change was like uh, counter app. Hai. Counter app we have count ko hold here and uh, just any count change was there. So count variable change was or just any set state call here. The widget tree, website tree. Next frame जब draw होगा, next frame draw होगा in the sense कि हम लोग का app में 60 fps पे काम कर रहा है। 60 fps पे काम कर रहे app को एक frame draw करने में कितना time लगेगा? एक second by 60 is around 60 milliseconds। तो हर frame के बीच में around 60 milliseconds का division बनता है। And next frame बनते ही like उसको पता चलेगा कि हाँ भाई this child is dirty, so we have to rebuild it. So, this then is built with that. Okay. Uh, immediately, maybe it's a hard concept, too, but once you keep on uh, building things and the debugging all the part, I have the like, performance profile is the other one. And then you will see the show repaint, uh, layout repaints, which will be cut away, then you will be able to see how much it will be. कि कब कब कौन कौन सा विजिट वाला पार्ट रिपीट हो और दैट में हेल्प यू अंडरस्टैंड दिस पार्ट ओह हाय आई एम फिलिप फ्रॉम द फ्लावर टीम एंड दिस इज थर्ड
video in Flutter, which is 101. Previously, you learned about stateless and stateful widgets. In this video, I'll be talking about inherited widgets. When your app gets larger and your widget tree gets more complex, passing and accessing data can get cumbersome. If you have four or five widgets nested one after the other, and there's a piece of data you need to get from the top <coughs> to the bottom, you're adding it to all those constructors and all those build methods. Ugh, I just want to reach up the tree to get that data. Fortunately, there's a widget type that allows just that. It's called inherited widget. When you put this widget in your tree, you can get a reference to it from any widget below it. My dad and my grandfather. They're both above me in the family tree, so I can inherit from them. So to be clear, this is not inherit as in a class hierarchy, but inherit as in a widget hierarchy. Let's see how we would implement one of those inherited widgets. We'll create a class called inherited nodes that extends inherited widgets. We need our widget to accept at least one parameter, and that's the child. This is already a valid inherited widget, but it's useless. Let's give it a nose. In this case, the nose will be an image asset of a nose. We'll just add that as a field of the inherited widget. Now any descendant of our inherited nose can get access to it in its build method by calling context.inheritWidget of exact type. By calling this method with the type of your custom inherited widget, you tell Flutter to go up the tree starting from the build context and look for a widget that matches that type. But to make things simpler and more readable, inherited widgets often include a static method called off which calls the inherit widget of exact type method for you. Now, we can rewrite our code in the descendant to read inherited nose dot off context, and that's nice. If this off context business seems familiar, that's because it is used by the Flutter framework itself. For example, you may know that the way to get the global theme of a material app, you do theme dot off context. Theme is, in fact, type of inherited widget. So is scaffold, focus scope, and many others. One thing about the inherited widget is that it is immutable. That is why our image asset is marked as final. You can only replace an inherited widget's field by rebuilding the whole widget. <coughs> Keep that in mind. Many inherited widgets will stay unchanged for the whole life cycle of the app. And that's okay. But the fact that something is final only means it cannot be reassigned. It does not mean it cannot change internally. For example, instead of a value, you can attach a service object to the inherited widget. It can be a wrapper around your database, a proxy for your web API, or a provider of assets. The service object can have its own internal state. It can initiate network calls, anything. In our case, no service will provide various nose related services. Each descendant of the inherited nose widget can easily get hold of the service through inherited nose dot off context. It can call methods on it, subscribe to streams, and so on. To summarize, inherited widget is very neat. It lets you access state from way above in the tree. So in the past three episodes, we've covered three really useful widgets, stateless, stateful, and inherited. Next time, we're going to talk about something very different, but equally important, keys. Also, be sure to head to Flutter.io to see all of our widgets.
would inherit a widget this form. But there, there is another gotcha that they failed to mention at times is that the off method that you saw, fetch widget of exact type, that is the actual method that uh, traverses the context tree upwards and then uh, finds that widget. You don't need an inherited widget exactly to access a service. You just need a static off method for that. What inherited widget does is it is used to refresh the tree, widget tree. Inherited widget ko a stateful widget so hold karta hai. Like inherited widget must be held by a stateful widget and then inherited widget ka jo state hota hai. Inherited widget in itself a stateless widget. Thik hai, jab hum ek inherited widget define karta hai, so inherited widget is itself a stateless widget. And stateless widget mein kya hota hai? Ki jitne par wo uska state change hota hai, the entire tree rebuilds. Matlab wo pura ka pura rebuild ho jata hai. And that is what happens with inherited widget. And उसका जो stateful widget है उसके ऊपर वो उस state को जैसे ही change किया पूरा का पूरा inherited widget change हो गया. तो वो जो change का notification है वो change का notification के लिए inherited widget का use किया जाता है ना कि like उसको access करने के लिए वो जो static off method है that is what is being used to access. तो ऐसे ही कोई भी class हम लोग define करके like ऐसे ही कोई भी stateful widget define करके उसमें अगर static off सर्विस प्रोवाइडर का जो बात हो रहा था कि लाइक इफ वी आर प्रोवाइडिंग अ सर्विस एंड दैट सर्विस ऑब्जेक्ट इज हैंडलिंग इट्स ओन स्टेट तो वो एक सिंपल ऑफ मेथड से भी हो सकता है वी डोंट नीड इनहेरिटेड विजिट फॉर दैट व्हाट वी नीड इनहेरिटेड विजिट फॉर इज टू रिफ्रेश द ट्री व्हेन द ऑब्जेक्ट चेंजेस ठीक है जब मतलब ऊपर से नीचे वो डेटा का चेंज का ऊपर डेटा चेंज हुआ तो इंफॉर्मेशन नीचे लाना है तब इनहेरिटेड विजिट
the stateless widget version, the row widget has a set of ordered slots for its children. As you've seen in the earlier episodes of the series, for every widget, Flutter builds a corresponding element. The element tree is extremely simple, only holding information about the type of each widget and a reference to children element. You can think of the element tree like a skeleton of your Flutter app. It shows the structure of your app, but all the additional information can be looked up via reference to the original widget. When we swap the order of the tile widgets in the row, Flutter walks the element tree to see if the skeletal structure is the same. It starts with the row element and then moves to its children. The element tree checks that the new widget is the same type and key as the old one, and if so, it updates its reference to the new widget. In this case, the widgets don't have keys, so Flutter just checks the type. It does the same for the second child. Now let's run through the same scenario again, only this time with stateful tile widgets. You can see I've got the same widgets and elements as before, but now there are a pair of state objects with them, and the color information is being stored there, not in the widgets themselves. So this time, when I swap the order of the two widgets, Flutter walks the element tree, checks the type of the row widget, and updates the reference. Then, tile element checks that the corresponding widget is the same type, a tile widget, and it is. And it does the same for the second child. Flutter uses the element tree and its corresponding state to determine what to actually display on your device. So from our perspective, it looks like your widgets didn't properly swap. In the second version with the stateful tiles, I added key properties to the widgets. Now if we swap the widgets, the row widgets match like before, but the key of the tile element doesn't match the key of the corresponding tile widget. So Flutter deactivates those elements, removing the references to the tile element in the element tree, starting with the first one that doesn't match. Then Flutter looks through the non-matching children for an element with the corresponding key. It finds a match and updates its reference to the corresponding widget. Flutter then does the same thing for the second child. Now, Flutter will display what we expect with the widgets swapping places and updating their color. So in summary, keys are useful if you're modifying the order or number of staple widgets in a collection. For the sake of illustration, I store the color as state in this example. Often though, state is much more subtle. Playing animations, displaying data that the user has entered, and scroll location all involve state. So, you have a scenario where you need a key for your app. Where do you put it? The answer is to specify a key at the top of the widget subtree that you need to preserve. Since we've been talking about state so much, you might think that it's the first state for widget, but you'd be wrong. <coughs> to show you why, I wrapped my colorful tile widgets with padding widgets, but I left the keys on the tile. Now, when I click the button, the tiles change to completely different random colors. What's going on? Here's what the positions of the tree algorithm looks at one level of the tree at a time. Children's children in the diagram, so we can focus on one level at a time. The first level of children are dropping notifications. The keys we're using in this example are local matching up widgets to elements. Flutter only looks that matches within a particular level in the tree. Any of the individual fields, like a first name or a birth name, might be the same as another entry. 
but the combination is unique. In this scenario, an object key is probably most important. If you have multiple widgets in your collection, the same value, or if you want to really ensure that each widget is distinct from all others, you can use the unique key. I used the unique key in the example app because we didn't have any other constant data that we're storing on our type. What the color will be until we construct the widget. But one thing you don't want to use is a random key. Every time a widget gets built, a new random number will be generated and you'll lose consistency between frames. Then you might not as well have used keys in the first place. Page door keys are specialized keys that store a user's scroll location so the app can preserve it for later. Global keys have two uses. They allow widgets to change parents anywhere in your app without losing state, or they can be used to access information about another widget in a completely different part of the widget tree. An example of the first scenario might be if you wanted to show the same widget on two different screens but holding all the same states. You'd want to use a global key. In the second scenario, maybe you want to validate a password, but you don't want to share that state Often though, global keys are a little like global variables. There's usually a better way to look up that state using inherited widgets or something like Redux or the block pack. So in summary, use keys when you want to preserve states across widget trees. This most commonly occurs when you're modifying a collection of widgets of the same type, like in a list. Put the key at the top of the widget tree you want preserved and choose the key type that you're using based on the type of data you're storing in that widget. For more documentation, check out Flutter.io. Happy creating. Okay, that was the last video for today. If you want to see the video before, I will also watch this four videos for the first time. <laughs> I knew that these are really good videos, but uh, I didn't know the time. So, chalo, okay. And like these videos, three four hours, they you will get daily comfortable in widgets. Widgets banana me kafi comfortable hoga. Agar ye videos three four hours dekho, chalo. Okay. Thank you. So, what's next? So I did. I was going through the reviews and all. And I saw someone say that uh, if it was a more project-based uh, experience, it would have been uh, much better. Kaam ko aasan karne ke liye launcher hai.